Joseph and His Friend, A Story of Pennsylvania, by Bayard Taylor. The better angel is a man right fair, the worser spirit a woman colored ill. Shakespeare. Sonnets. New York, G. P. Putnam and Sons, 4th Avenue and 23rd Street. London, S. Lowe, Sun and Marston, 1870. Entered according to Act of Congress, in the year 1870, by Bayard Taylor, in the office of the Librarian of Congress at Washington. The New York Printing Company, 81, 83, and 85, Center St. New York. Joseph and His Friend, A Story of Pennsylvania. To those who prefer quiet pictures of life to startling incidents, the attempt to illustrate the development of character to the mysteries of an elaborate plot, and the presentation of men and women in their mixed strength and weakness to the painting of wholly virtuous ideals and wholly evil examples, who are as interested in seeing moral and intellectual forces at work in a simple country community as on a more conspicuous plane of human action, who believe in the truth and tenderness of man's love for man as of man's love for woman, who recognize the trouble which confused ideas of life and the lack of high and intelligent culture bring upon a great portion of our country population. To all such, no explanation of this volume is necessary. Others will not read it. Chapter 1 Joseph. Rachel Miller was not a little surprised when her nephew Joseph came to the supper table, not from the direction of the barn and through the kitchen, as usual, but from the back room upstairs where he slept. His workday dress had disappeared. He wore his best Sunday suit, put on with unusual care, and there were faint pomatum odors in the air when he sat down to the table. Her face said, and she knew it, as plain as any words, what in the world does this mean? Joseph, she saw, endeavored to look as though coming down to supper in that costume were his usual habit. So she poured out the tea in silence. Her silence, however, was eloquent. A hundred interrogation marks would not have expressed its import. And Dennis, the hired man, who sat on the other side of the table, experienced very much the same apprehension of something forthcoming as when he had killed her favorite speckled hen by mistake. Before the meal was over, the tension between Joseph and his aunt had so increased by reason of their mutual silence that it was very awkward and oppressive to both, yet neither knew how to break it easily. There is always a great deal of unnecessary reticence in the intercourse of country people, and in the case of these two it had been specially strengthened by the want of every relationship except that of blood. They were quite ignorant of the fence, the easy thrust and parry of society where talk becomes an art. Silence or the bluntest utterance were their alternatives, and now the one had neutralized the other. Both felt this and Dennis, in his dull way, felt it too. Although not a party concerned, he was uncomfortable, yet also internally conscious of a desire to laugh. The resolution of the crisis, however, came by his aid. When the meal was finished, and Joseph betook himself to the window, awkwardly drumming upon the pane, while his aunt gathered the plates and cups together, delaying to remove them, as was her wont, Dennis said with his hand on the doorknob. Shall I saddle the horse right off? I guess so, Joseph answered after a moment's hesitation. Rachel paused with the two silver spoons in her hand. Joseph was still drumming upon the window, but with very irregular taps. The door closed upon Dennis. Well, said she with singular calmness, a body is not bound to dress particularly fine for watching though I would as soon show him that much respect, if need be, as anybody else. Don't forget to ask Maria if there's anything I can do for her. Joseph turned around with a start, a most innocent surprise on his face. Why, aunt, what are you talking about? You are not going to Warren's to watch? They have nearer neighbors, to be sure, but when a man dies, everybody is free to offer their services. He was always strong in the faith. Joseph knew that he was caught, without suspecting her maneuver. A brighter color ran over his face, up to the roots of his hair. Why, no, he exclaimed. I am going to Warriners to spend the evening. 
there's to be a little company there, a neighborly gathering. I believe it's been talked of this long while, but I was only invited today. I saw Bob in the road field. Rachel endeavored to conceal from her nephew's eye the immediate impression of his words. A constrained smile passed over her face and was instantly followed by a cheerful relief in his. Isn't it rather a strange time of year for evening parties? She then asked with a touch of severity in her voice. They meant to have it in cherry time, Bob said, when Anna's visitor had come from town. That indeed I see, Rachel exclaimed. It's to be a sort of celebration for what's her name? Blessing, I know, but the other? Anna Warner was there last Christmas, and I don't suppose the high notions are out of her head yet. Well, I hope it'll be some time before they take root here. Peace and quiet, peace and quiet, that's been the token of the neighborhood. But town ways are the reverse. All the young people are going, Joseph mildly suggested, and so... Oh, I don't say you shouldn't go this time, Rachel interrupted him for you ought to be able to judge for yourself what's fit and proper and what is not. I should be sorry to be sure to see you doing anything and going anywhere that would make your mother uneasy if she were living now. It's so hard to be conscientious and to mind a body's bounden duty without seeming to interfere. She heaved a deep sigh and just touched the corner of her apron to her eyes. The mention of his mother always softened Joseph and in his earnest desire to live so that his life might be such as to give her joy if she could share it, a film of doubt spread itself over the smooth, pure surface of his mind. A vague consciousness of his inability to express himself clearly upon the question without seeming to slight her memory affected his thoughts. But remember, Aunt Rachel, he said at last, I was not old enough then to go into society. She surely meant that I should have some independence when the time came. I am doing no more than all the young men of the neighborhood. Ah, uh, yes, I know, she replied in a melancholy tone. But they've got used to it by degrees, and mostly in their own homes, and with sisters to caution them, whereas you're younger, according to your years, and innocent of the ways and wiles of men and, and girls, Joseph painfully felt that this last assertion was true, suppressing the impulse to exclaim, Why am I younger according to my years? Why am I so much more innocent, which is ignorant than others? He blundered out with a little display of temper. Well, how am I ever to learn? By patience and taking care of yourself. There's always safety in waiting. I don't mean you shouldn't go this evening since you've promised it and made yourself smart. But mark my words, this is only the beginning. The season makes no difference. Townspeople never seem to know that there are such things as hay harvest and corn to be worked. They come out for merrymakings in the busy time and want us country folks to give up everything for their pleasure. The tired plow horses must be geared up for them, and the cows wait an hour or two longer to be milked while they're driving around, and the chickens killed half-grown, and the washing and baking put off when it comes in their way. They're mighty nice and friendly while it lasts, but go back to them in town six months afterwards and see whether they'll so much as ask you to take a meal's victuals. Joseph began to laugh. It is not likely, he said, that I shall ever go to the blessings for a meal or that this Miss Julia, as they call her, will ever interfere with our harvesting or milking. The airs they put on, Rachel continued, she'll very likely think that she's doing you a favor by so much as speaking to you. When the bishops had boarders two years ago, one of them said, Maria told me with her own mouth, why don't all the farmers follow your example? It would be so refining for them. They may be very well in their place, but for my part, I should like them to stay there. There comes the horse, said Joseph. I must be on the way. I expect to meet Elwood Withers at the Lane End, but about waiting at, you hardly need... Oh, yes, I'll wait for you, of course. Ten o'clock is not so very late for me. It might be a little after, he suggested. Not much, I hope, but if it should be daybreak, wait, I will. Your mother couldn't expect less of me. 
When Joseph whirled into the saddle, the thought of his aunt, grimly waiting for his return, was already perched like an imp on the crupper and clung to his sides with claws of steel. She, looking through the window, also felt that it was so, and much relieved went back to her household duties. He rode very slowly down the lane with his eyes fixed on the ground. There was a rich orange flush of sunset on the hills across the valley. Masses of burning cumuli hung self-suspended above the farthest woods and such depths of purple-gray opened beyond them as are wont to rouse the slumbering fancies and hopes of a young man's heart. But the beauty and fascination and suggestiveness of the hour could not lift his downcast, absorbed glance. At last his horse, stopping suddenly at the gate, gave a whinny of recognition, which was answered. Elwood Withers laughed. Can you tell me where Joseph Aston lives? He cried. An old man, very much bowed and bent. Joseph also laughed with a blush, as he met the other's strong, friendly face. There is plenty of time, he said, leaning over his horse's neck and lifting the latch of the gate. All right, but you must now wake up. You're spruce enough to make a figure tonight. Oh, no doubt, Joseph gravely answered. But what kind of a figure? Some people, I've heard say, said Elwood, may look into their looking glass every day and never know how they look. If you appeared to yourself as you appear to me, you wouldn't ask such a question as that. If I could only not think of myself at all, Elwood, if I could be as unconcerned as you are, but I'm not Joseph, my boy, Elwood interrupted, riding nearer and laying a hand on his friend's shoulder. I tell you, it weakens my very marrow to walk into a room full of girls, even though I know every one of them. They know it, too, and shy and quiet as they seem, they're unmerciful. There they sit, all looking so different, somehow, even a fellow's own sisters and cousins, filling up all sides of the room rustling a little and whispering a little, but you feel that every one of them has her eyes on you and would be so glad to see you flustered. There's no help for it, though. We've got to grow case-hardened to that much, or however could a man get married. Elwood, Joseph asked after a moment's silence, were you ever in love? Well, and Elwood pulled up his horse in surprise, well, you do come out plump. You take the breath out of my body. Have I been in love? Have I committed murder? One's about as deadly a secret as the other. The two looked each other in the face. Elwood's eyes answered the question, but Joseph's, large, shy, and utterly innocent, could not read the answer. It's easy to see you've never been, said the former, dropping his voice to a grave gentleness. If I should say, yes, what then? Then how do you know it? I mean, how did you first begin to find it out? What is the difference between that and the feeling you have towards any pleasant girl whom you like to be with? All the difference in the world, Elwood exclaimed with energy, then paused and knitted his brows with a perplexed air. But I'll be shot if I know exactly what else to say. I never thought of it before. How do I know that I am Elwood Withers? It seems just as plain as that, and yet, well, for one thing, she's always in your mind, and you think and dream of just nothing but her, and you'd rather have the hem of her dress touch you than kiss anybody else, and you want to be near her and to have her all to yourself, yet it's hard work to speak a sensible word to her when you come together. But what's the use? A fellow must feel it himself, as they say, of experiencing religion. He must get converted, or he'll never know. Now, I don't suppose you've understood a word of what I've said. Yes, Joseph answered. Indeed, I think so. It's only an increase of what we all feel towards some persons. I have been hoping, latterly, that it might come to me, but, but, but your time will come like every man's, said Elwood, and maybe sooner than you think. When it does, you won't need to ask anybody, though I think you're bound to tell me of it after pumping my own secret out of me. Joseph looked grave. Never mind, I wasn't obliged to let you have it. I know you're close-mouthed and honest-hearted, Joseph, 
but I'll never ask your confidence unless you can give it as freely as I give mine to you. You shall have it, Elwood, if my time ever comes, and I can't help wishing for the time, although it may not be right. You know how lonely it is on the farm, and yet it's not always easy for me to get away into company. Aunt Rachel stands in mother's place to me, and maybe it's only natural that she should be over-concerned. Anyway, seeing what she has done for my sake, I am hindered from opposing her wishes too stubbornly. Now, tonight, my going didn't seem right to her, and I shall not get it out of my mind that she is waiting up and perhaps fretting on my account. A young fellow of your age mustn't be so tender, Elwood said. If you had your own father and mother, they'd allow you more of a range. Look at me with mine. Why, I never as much as say, by your leave. Quite the contrary. So long as the work isn't slighted, they're rather glad than not to have me go out, and the house is twice as lively since I bring so much fresh gossip into it. But then I've had a rougher bringing up. I wish I had had, cried Joseph. Yet no, when I think of mother, it is wrong to say just that. What I mean is, I wish I could take things as easily as you, make my way boldly in the world without being held back by trifles or getting so confused with all sorts of doubts. The more anxious I am to do right, the more embarrassed I am to know what is the right thing. I don't believe you have any such troubles. Well, for my part, I do about as other fellows. No worse, I guess, and likely no better. You must consider also that I'm a bit rougher made besides the bringing up, and that makes a deal of difference. I don't try to make the scales balance to a grain. If there's a handful under or over, I think it's near enough. However, you'll be all right in a while. When you find the right girl and marry her, it'll put a new face onto you. There's nothing like a sharp, wide-awake wife, so they say, to set a man straight. Don't make a mountain of anxiety out of a little molehill of inexperience. I'd take all your doubts, and more, I'm sure, if I could get such a 200-acre farm with them. Do you know, cried Joseph eagerly, his blue eyes flashing through the gathering dusk, I have often thought very nearly the same thing. If I were to love, if I were to marry... Hush, interrupted Elwood. I know you don't mean others to hear you. Here come two down the branch road. The horsemen, neighboring farmers' sons, joined them. They rode together up the knoll towards the Warrener mansion, the lights of which glimmered at intervals through the trees. The gate was open, and a dozen vehicles could be seen in the enclosure between the house and barn. Bright, gliding forms were visible on the portico. Just see, whispered Elwood to Joseph, what a lot of posy colors. You may be sure they're everyone watching us. No flinching mind, straight to the charge. We'll walk up together, and it won't be half as hard for you.